you put up the Dresden Dolls at our very first show in Philly when we played the North Star Bar, you somehow found us and invited us. But I don't remember how. Okay, this is... <laughs> Tell the story. Yeah, um, I was in a band. I was in Nikki Jane's band. Right. And we played in Boston. And we played before you guys. And somebody, and Nikki said, well, now we're going to go to the hotel. And Amanda said, hotel? No, you shall stay with us. And so Nikki stayed at the Cloud Club that night, and I stayed with, with somebody else. And then, and we didn't know you. We'd never met you. And I'm like, who's this guy with the weird hat? I remember thinking that. I'm like, is he serious about that hat? Little did you, that hat is powerful. <laughs> it is, it is. I've come to love the hat. And then a couple months later, my phone rang, and it was you, and you, you were like, we're in Philly, we need a place to stay. I'm like, totally. Oh. And the house next door to me had just fallen down in a hurricane. And, Auspicious. And, there were all, and it was a pile of bricks. And so we did this photo shoot of them laying in the bricks, which sort of is like the bed song thing now that I think of it. But if you've seen the picture of the Dresden Dolls laying in the bricks, that was the first picture we did together. And yeah, that was how it all started. Ago. And that picture got really huge. It was because it was one of the... Well, and it was favorite. perfect for the Dresden Dolls, yeah. which was all about beauty and destruction mm -hmm. and the beauty and destruction. So now we know. That's how I met this dude. And that was like 13 years ago. It was ago? a long time ago, yeah. <laughs> We're old. <laughs> um, do you want to ask some questions? So Kyle went through the Ask Amanda basket, and, and he is going to select what he thinks are the, the goodest questions. So um, this is something that we sort of talked about, but you might want to throw a little bit more into it. Um, was there anything that you were persuaded to cut from the book during editing that you wish you had fought harder to keep? Uh, yeah. Uh, although, so the, the process of writing this book and then editing it down was really, it was really interesting and it was really personal. I, um, I don't know how many of you out there have written books. I, I don't recommend it. It's a pain in the ass. And I was also, I was given by my publisher, um, Hachette, a, you know, not a, if you don't get it done, you will die and will, you know, and, and, and you'll be in breach of contract. But they told me that if my book were to come out on this particular Tuesday, November 11th, they would make it the lead title of the fall, which is a big deal. It means they would give it a lot of money and attention but I had to write it really fast. And so I went to the person who, in my life, who knows most about books, I went to Neil, and I was like, do you, it's, you know, I would need to get it done by, I don't know, I'd need to get it done by May, and it's January. Can I write a book in two months? And he was like, I don't know, I think you can. <laughs> I was like, two months doesn't seem very long. And he was like, just, so I, I literally did fucking nothing for two solid months. Almost no email, almost no socializing, um, pretty much nothing but waking up. I went to Australia to be away from everything. I woke up, I had two cups of coffee, I went to yoga, and then I wrote 5,000 words a day for two months. And then I had a pile of shit. <laughs> that looked like it might someday be a book, but it was a bunch of uncapitalized blog-style writing. Um, and I sort of shaped it together into a 150,000-word, very, very, very rough manuscript. And I gave it... I had two editors on, by my side, Jamie and Emily. Jamie, who was my friend, and Emily, who was from the publisher... Um, and with Jamie, I kind of pieced it together into some shape, and then I gave it to Neil, who I trusted more than anybody because he understands arc and story, and I knew that he would know what could possibly be taken out. And I basically, I took the manuscript, printed out, took it to him because he offered and was like, 
here, take it, cut, cut it down. <laughs> and he took a pen and he cut 50,000 words out of the book and handed it back to me and I made a deal with him that I wouldn't look at what he had cut. I had handed it back to my editor, said make me a new manuscript, I'll reread it and if I really feel like something is missing, I'll know. I'll be like, where the fuck is this really important part? And I just, it was like a blind trust fall. And I also, I was on such a crazy schedule that I didn't have a lot of time to go comparing and contrasting. I just trusted him. And when I got to a certain point in the, you know, in the story and was like, where's that great anecdote about that thing that's missing? I would go search, find it, paste it back in, and then have an argument with my editor and Neil about whether or not it belonged there. And there were a couple, <laughs> there's, th the things that I really fought for were stupid things, <laughs> but they were really funny to me. Like there was this totally irrelevant anecdote when I'm working, when I'm first doing the Eight Foot Bride and I'm working in the ice cream store where I'm keeping my shit in the basement and there was an employee there named Mike Penta who was amazing, who I loved. He was a drug dealer. <laughs> but he was like one of those like really ADD drug dealers, like always called me a Meta Palmer and he talked with his hands like this and he like, dealt ecstasy, but it was really good ecstasy. It was like pure MDMA, and he was just amazing, and he, he was just awesome. And there was a great, and he, he kept the store immaculate. He was one of those super hyper ADD guys who if there weren't any customers, he would like have a toothbrush in his hand and be like scrubbing shit off some part of the store, whereas I never did shit, shit like that. If the store was slow, I would like call my friends and chat with people. And all of these weird people came into Toscanini. This is a section about the weird people of Harvard Square, the homeless people and the, the crazy people and the, the, the oddballs that came into the store and would trade things for, you know, with us. And we had all these strange barter systems. Like there was a really whacked out guy named Hugo who would make watercolors and trade them for coffee, you know, and trade us a watercolor for a coffee every day. And we had like 200 of his watercolors in the back ice cream, um, like scooping land. And one of the best stories that I fought for, I fought for like six times and it kept getting cut, was this guy who came in one day and put a crack pipe <laughs> on the counter in the ice cream store. And Mike Penta got all bent out of shape because it was dirty. He was like, dude, don't, don't put a dirty crack pipe on my counter. It's a crack pipe on my counter. Get it away. I just cleaned that. And I was like, but also, like, it's a crack pipe. <laughs> that part got cut. <laughs> Moving right along. Occasionally, I'll, I'll look at Twitter and I'll, and I'll say like, wow, John Scalzi has way more followers than I do. And then I realize that like 20% of those people are on there just to like try and cause him grief and fight with him. And I don't think, I don't think anybody on Twitter tries to cause me grief, but you have that problem. Like, I do. How do you, so somebody asked, what do you do when you feel alienated? But I want to ask, um, th there seems to be some baggage that comes with uh, fame and that people... What happens when people want to fight you for no reason other than they're pugilistic? And what do you do? What do you do when that happens? I can tell when people want to fight me for no reason and I just ignore them because, you know, because why, why on earth would you engage with a person like that? The hardest thing is when people who are really um, genuinely, authentically, like compassionately communicating with me disagree with me because I feel... A, I feel a responsibility to answer those people. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's, it's really hard because we just disagree about a certain, you know, piece of politics or, you know, what have you. But it's, um, it's interesting. I just got on Facebook really, like, as an engaged user of Facebook for the first time in December. And up until then, I've been gathering, you know, a, a community on Facebook, but just sort of like cross-posting my blog and never actually going over there and hanging out. And Facebook is weird. <laughs> like, I, I, I entered it just sort of assuming it would be like Twitter or 
like Tom, or you know, I, it, and it turns out that it is this, it's its own universe with its own etiquette and its own rules. I learned this lesson actually, my first week writing the book in Australia, I was still staying, you know, sort of vaguely posting things on Twitter and social media. And I popped up an article on Facebook just because I thought it was interesting and I learned the lesson that sharing an article on Facebook means that you are endorsing that article unless you really strongly state otherwise. You can't just share something because it's interesting. And that was the day I was like, yeah, I think maybe while I'm writing my book, I should just stay off social media because you never know when you're me. You never know when you're gonna do something that feels sort of, you know, harmless and conversational, but it's gonna, you know, it's gonna come back and kick you in the ass. And it was, it was, I talked to Neil about this a lot because Neil goes on social media hiatuses when he really has to write. And the reason isn't that he doesn't wanna go out there and like do the fun engagement that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's that the ch if, you, if, you're, if you have that many followers and you're engaged enough, you kind of have a one in 20 chance of winding up in a shitstorm just because. And if you have really important work to do, even though it's really tempting to go on Twitter and Facebook and enjoy your community and the discussions and the love and the, you know, all of the good stuff that comes with it, if you have something really fucking important to do, like a book to edit, and you don't want to risk getting trapped in having to defend what you said about your friend from London radio because he was accused of ex like whatever it is that happens to waft through the environment that day, your only true chance of safety is to just stay away. And so when he writes books and has to fully go, you know, AWOL, that's what he does. And I found myself when I was really in the the last parts of editing the book, I could lose an entire half a day, not because I was sitting there twittering my defense, but because my head was twittering my defense. And someone would say something really nasty and you know, a bunch of people would be yelling at me and I would be sitting there trying to edit my book, but composing my response and, and totally distracted by that stuff. And I was like, wow, what a, what a waste. Like I'm really, my brain is being totally pulled in this other direction and I need it for this other more important thing. So I learned uh, like that whole year of, you know, our half year of writing a book really taught me a lot about that. All right, so here's, here's another one. And I, I feel this too, uh, this person, Tyler says, with how busy you are, how do you stay sane? And I know when I do something, you know, I'll go somewhere and I'll take some picture and I'll come back and I'll be like, I am not moving from my sofa for three days because I, you know, I just flew to Boston and back. But I see like, you know, you and Neil like, oh, we're in London. We went for this party and, you know, tomorrow we're going to be in Vienna and then Thursday we're going to be in Florida. And how do you keep up that schedule and stay sane? Just like Tyler asks. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, just, I just do it. I mean, it's sort of like how do you get the dishes done every day and how do you make sure the cat gets fed? And, you know, um, it's, it's, just a, it's just sort of a set of things to do and a, sp and a speed of life at which I go. And I've got to say, being off tour, um, especially when you're on tour for a while, can be, it's, it's sort of like being on a train that stops and all the shit slides off the table. Like when you're used to going at a certain speed, slowing down can f really feel like a crash. And I've gone through a lot of cycles like that, and a lot of touring musicians I know have that weirdness, especially if they've been touring for five or 10 years, and then they finally decide to take a break, and they're so excited to take a break, and they think they're gonna do the equivalent of just lying on their couch for three days, and they're gonna just read and hang out with their friends, and their brains and their bodies are still on the, you know, still like on the train tracks sliding away from them and it can be the most disorienting feeling to try to become domestic after you're used to living out of a backpack for months and months. I will say that when I'm sitting on my sofa, I'm plotting a book. <laughs> yeah, well, you start using your brain <laughs> instead of your body. I um, noticed uh, a year or so ago a tweet from you that you were at a party at Liza Minnelli's house. Or the or was it, she was at a party, party at somebody else's and house. And I remember th thinking that um, 
occasionally something like that happens to me, and I don't have time to tell anybody about it or write it down, and then it just goes away, you know. And I'm wondering um, if you can think of, off the top of your head, five really cool things that happened that your life was just going by so fast that you didn't have time to either properly appreciate or to tell people about. Being at a so party that like Liza a, Minnelli like, was at is one. It's like a speed round humble brag. <laughs> um, I don't, there have been so many. And that is like, that's the other giant paradox of living on the road. It's like a day will go by and there's an entire story in that day, but you have to collapse and sleep and wake up and go experience the insane story of the next day. And I, and as a blogger, you can understand this, I would just spend my days mourning that I didn't have the energy to reflect on and share this amazing experience that's a life-changing, dot-connecting, fucked-up experience that I had the day before and the, the mentors that I met and the things that we talked about and the things that happened because I was too busy living the next moment and, you know, until I finally got to the point where I was like, Amanda, you don't need to fucking tell everybody everything. Just shut the fuck up and enjoy your life. And, you know, and I, and I really, like, a few years ago, I just gave myself the pass on my, you know, on the blog and was like, you don't have to share everything. You'll, you know, you'll be fine. And enjoy the moments. Tell your friends when you're feeling inspired, and, and I will, like, if, if my life slows down, I'll often wake up and crank out a 3,000-word blog and publish it with whatever happens to be going through my head at the time. And I love the internet for this reason, because it is, it's so immediate, and there's such a great instant gratification of saying a thing and then getting all of this energy um, and connection back from people that it's, that it's wonderful. But I also do worry you know, having grown up, like I'm looking out at a lot of you in, and, you know, a lot of you are my age or you're in your 30s or whatever. We grew up without being able to impulsively share every fucking thing that was happening to us. And you've got to admit it's a little weird that there is now a generation gap of massive proportion that we grew up unable to share immediately our everyday existences and everything that happened to us and every photo we took. And that, you know, anybody who is now 15 or even 20 or 25 doesn't necessarily know what it's like to live in a realm where that wasn't possible. Although Elizabeth Barrett Browning had all these amazing experiences too, and she managed to like go up to her room and sit down and write for two hours at the end of every night and you know, remember all of these conversations in a way that I think sadly just doesn't happen anymore. Because I'm like, oh, if I tweet I met Liza Minnelli, then I'm done with it. I don't have to like, you know, I don't have to be articulate about it for posterity because it's like taken care of, right? Right, but isn't that weird? It's like, very weird. What constitutes taken care of and what constitutes having a, a, a meaningful experience? And this is what fucks us up and what I really worry about is that like, Thought number one, oh my God, I'm having a meaningful experience. Thought number two, oh my God, this meaningful experience doesn't count unless I share it with someone. Thought number three, this meaningful experience doesn't mean anything unless I share it with someone and they reply and validate that I just had a meaningful experience. Like, we can really trap ourselves here, so we have to be careful. One, one thing that I find myself disliking about uh, Twitter and Facebook is that that like the immediate response that you're talking about and as I have been blogging for a long time and I write my blog as my own diary I write it for me you know so that I'll be able to go back in 15 years and, and see what was happening and I find that I'm doing that less because I'm like aha Twitter I just met Liza Minnelli and you know and I think that part of that record is is vanishing and that kind of scares me yeah it's Twitter is so ephemeral, but then again, so are blogs. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I ask myself a few questions when I'm feeling particularly morbid and existential. One is, okay, so we're gonna die. Let's just remember that occasionally it's really helpful. Number two is, if the internet just vanished tomorrow, would we be okay? 
And I ask myself that constantly, like, am I totally reliant on Twitter, Facebook, the internet, blah, 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 these things to actually feel human, feel connected, feel okay? And if the answer is yes, maybe that's not good. And maybe, uh, you know, maybe <laughs> don't put all of your eggs in the internet basket. Also have friend, real flesh friend. Um, so... Yeah, we should, we should probably wrap it up because I, we, I feel like we could talk for four hours and these people would just one by one go home. Um, do you have one last one? One more real quick, and I think, should I stay in college? Uh, I'm not looking, in case you want to stay anonymous, <laughs> to me. <laughs> do you like it? <laughs> then take a year off. You don't, have to, you don't have to make a giant commitment. Ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Cassidy. Take a picture of him. Can, uh, can Kyle take a picture of you guys before we wrap up this evening?